Hello, and welcome to our very first webinar here with the Institute for Family. I am super excited that you could join us today, and thank you for taking an interest in a conversation that we hope will shape the future of our system. My name is Jaquaya Wilson, and I am an advocate for youth. I'm a professional in the field, and I'm also an alumni of the child welfare system. Here with me is my co-host, Vice President for the Center for Systems and Innovations, and ally, Sandra Gasca Gonzalez. The Institute is a brand new platform where parents and professionals can come together to elevate family well being, not just families within the child welfare system, but all families. We envision a future where we have dramatically reduced our over reliance on foster care, and families are thriving. I want to take a few seconds to really explain how important today's conversation is. With our current focus on child safety as a main priority, our system has not prioritized family well being. While our objective is to keep children safe, we neglect to listen to family voice, missing their experience, and what they can teach us. We believe that family well being should be at the center of the conversation. Today, we will talk about why we need to advance a family well being focus and how we can believe in and empower families. In my own experience within the child welfare system, I learned early on that family could be strong by learning how to better communicate. My own family could be stronger. When tragedy struck, the lack of skill made me vulnerable. So I'm here today to learn so that I can change the way that I communicate. And one day I can have a stronger family. I'd like to kick it off and uh, pass it to our co-host, Ms. Sandra Gonzalez. Thanks, Jaquoya. And let me just say, I love being a co-host with you. It's an honor. Thanks for uh, for being a partner with me in this. Um, you know, I just, I've been thinking a lot about what you're trying to accomplish at the Institute for Family and what you said about communication and family. And I wanted to just say a little bit about why I come into this work the way that I do, because you mentioned the word ally, and I appreciate that. That's That means a lot to me. And um, I do see myself that way. And on any given day, I might fall short of being an ally, but I sure will always uh, be put myself out there to be an ally for, for youth, for children, and for families. And, you know, the way I come to this work really is from a shattered dream that I had, which was I originally, I had shared this with you, had originally decided to be an outpatient therapist years, decades ago, like 20, well, we won't go how far, but several decades ago. And my first caseload was with youth, children, and parents who had been separated. And so at the age of 20 something, I was sitting in four walls in an office, counseling families who had gone through some pretty significant challenges. And I was shattered by the stigmas that we were required to put on families and, and the children when there was so much more social context that was missing. And the reasons that they might be depressed or traumatized were less about the reasons they became separated to begin with. It was about the harm that was uh, being done through the system by keeping them apart, by keeping families apart. But the thing that always has struck me is the, the resilience and the strength that families brought into that office and, and bring every day as they're experiencing the system. And you know what I experienced decades ago is in that role in, in a different state, that's like all in my rear view mirror, but what is in front of us today really is the same, it's pretty similar and we have to change that. And that's my why, that's why I, I think it's important what you all are doing and I, I, I want to, just get the audience input here. And if you could please put into the chat why you all decided to join this webinar. Talk, talk to us about what is your why. Uh, we think it would be really good for you all to, for us to hear uh, what's on your mind about this conversation as Leah and I co-host together and get this off the ground. And wow. while you're doing that, um, we, can, we can just say a little bit more about the webinar. Wow, Sandra, thank you so much for, um laying that out and for be will, being willing to help um, facilitate this conversation with me. I think um, for me, the why really 
uh, takes part in how I was raised and um, the things that I saw within my own family. Uh, now that I'm a little bit older, I have two dogs and how I communicate with them is really important. I mean, they're just a small part of my family, but they really are uh, who I consider to be my family. And so um, I've been learning how to train and how to communicate. And I think today here um, on this platform, we'll have some very interesting guests who can um, explain to us and share their experiences to their why, uh, why they're here today to have this conversation with us. Yeah. So should we, sh should we jump into what this webinar is about, the intentions? Should we go ahead and do that? Or yeah. do we want to lift up some of the things that people are saying in the chat? Oh, well, I think there's a lot of power. It's going fast and furious. Yeah, yeah. so really we're going to keep it moving, okay? <laughs> awesome. All right, so let me just give us a, a quick overview uh, about the intention of the webinar. And thank you all so much. Keep it coming. We want to know um, your why and why you're here. Uh, but, the, but just to give you some quick overview, the Institute for Family is sponsoring a three-part webinar series on the unlearning of child welfare and today is the first of those three. So this is inaugural. You all are here with Jacquea and I uh, for the first time, and it's one of many, I'm sure, to come, but we are having a three-part webinar series. We wanna start off by talking about why we should create a child and family well-being system. We did send some pre-read article, uh, a pre-read article in the, um, in the email that you received. So hopefully everyone was able to read about Brian Samuel's urgent call, uh, call to action for family and child well-being. This article really does help to set that context of our discussion today. So peruse it if you can while we're chatting, if you haven't had a chance to look at it. And then some of you might have heard about one particular effort that recently launched, which is called the Thriving Family Safer Children National Effort. And that's really a commitment to well-being that aims to move from the traditional reactive child protection systems uh, the, to those that are designed to support child and family well-being and prevent child maltreatment and unnecessary family separations to begin with. And you have uh, two people that I'll introduce here that are part of that effort, but this is not solely about that effort. The goal today is really to start a conversation about advancing child and family well-being and how this will require us to unlearn, unlearn, we're learning and unlearning some of what we know and what we've done in the past to create something new to strengthen families and prevent child welfare involvement. So that's what today is about. It's a conversation, right, Jaquia? Yeah, just a conversation. We're just having a conversation. So we intentionally wanted to have this dialogue and, and learn from various perspectives about why we need to make this shift and to help us do that. We have a great panel and I'm gonna introduce them real quick. Uh, so first, we have Shronda Selivanov, who is a social service specialist and a birth parent advocate from Washington State Office of Public Defense in Seattle, Washington. We have David Kelly, who is the special assistant to the associate commissioner at the Children's Bureau. Welcome, David and Sharonda. And Melissa Merrick, who is the CEO of Prevent Child Abuse America and Matt Anderson, the director at the Institute for Family and the reason we're all here, right, Jaquia? Yeah, definitely. He, he's the culprit. Mm -hmm. um, so one other thing, thank you so much for all that you are putting in the chat. We're gonna put you to work again, just wanting to do a quick poll question. Uh, we thought it would be a, a good baseline to get a sense of how familiar you are with the concept of child and family well-being systems, uh, what that means and what that looks like. So we're gonna put the poll up right now. Um, and the question is, how familiar are you with the concept of a child and family well-being system? So please vote. Let us know. Are you familiar with the term? Are you uh, very familiar? Or you have no idea what we're talking about today. <laughs> And that's fair, right? Because yeah. well-being has all kinds of different meanings to different people. That's right. So I think we are getting a sense here. Uh, my poll, went, there it is. So here is how the poll is uh, 
faring so far? How familiar are you with the concept of a child and family well-being system? We appreciate the honesty with the, the, those who are not familiar and those who are somewhat familiar, that's great. That means that um, we're in this journey together to learn more um, and we're gonna get, we're gonna jump right into getting that started. Uh, so Jaquia, co-host, yeah. take it over. All right, well, I've shared a little bit about why I'm here today and I wanna share just a little bit more as we dive into our uh, panelist responses. So I really want to learn today how I can change, uh, like I said, my own family's future. Um, I want to break those generational curses of lack of communication. Uh, when tragedy struck and hit my family, um, we in part failed to stay connected due to the lack of communication, right? And so when I have children, I want to make sure that they're equipped with the skills that they need to not just survive during tragedy, um, but to really thrive and um, to be uh, well off even after. So um, with that, you know, I want to really focus on why we should move towards a uh, child and family well-being system, right? Um, what are the benefits? Um, so I'm going to ask our first panelist, uh, Ms. Sharonda, what is the foundational experience that taught you that you were, that we need to build something new that focuses on prevention and addressing the conditions that family face? Well, the first thing I'm just gonna start off by saying language matters. And we have this system in place that says child welfare. So from the onset, you can disregard me as a person who um, needs care because we were saying that the child needs to be the focus in the center. A family well-being uh, system essentially says, we're gonna look at the whole family. Family is sacred and it means something to each and every one of us and it looks different to every one of us. And so my experience has really taught me that, you know, I, I came from some um, conditions that were not necessarily favorable to uh, healthy development, but it doesn't mean that I don't have redeemable qualities and I don't have strengths and beauties about who I am even coming from those conditions. And that as I look at us moving towards a family well-being system, what I recognize is, is that we see worth in each and every person in that family. I'm always kind of baffled, right, the way that the system operates, because I wonder how we um, instill hope and worth in children when we remove them out of everything that they've ever known. And I question, you know, if you don't worth, if you don't have worth for my family, how do you have worth for me? And I think that there's those unsaid messaging that we don't necessarily want to confront because we have a way of seeing that we've done something good by removal. Um, your data says something completely counter to that. Um, and so um, as we move to our, towards the child and welfare being, what I'm recognizing is, is that we wanna really um, keep each member, siblings, aunts, uncles, community members at the center of our work. Um, we recognize that each person has an importance and value. We want to um, have that uh, be a reminder and as we move towards the center of uh, what family well-being, I want to just say we have to really recognize the conditions. And are the conditions, conditions that folks are living in, does that support well-being? And if it doesn't, how are we moving towards that? So um, historically, we have very little investment in families. We have a high end of investment on the uh, other end of uh, rehoming families and putting them in places so that they can receive those supports there. Um, so as we move towards a family well-being system, what I can tell you is, is that we should be really focused on our investment, keeping families together, knowing that each person has an important role in the development and overall societal importance. Um, and we want to really uh, start to generate that for not just the family, but society as a whole. Wow, it's powerful. And Melissa, would you like to respond? I would love to. And actually, I just want to pick up on something that Tronda said, and it's the word conditions, because I agree that language matters. Um, but it's important that we understand too what conditions we're talking about. I think so often we think about physical conditions without thinking about the socio-political conditions. Mm -hmm. We know that there are some policy strategies that help children and families reach their maximum health and life potential and others that really just don't do good enough. So I came to this work really similar to kind of what Sandra shared, but 
uh, my PhD is in child psychology. I was on a postdoctoral fellowship in a child protection team in Miami. And I was a, a young mom. I had you know, a nine month old baby. So probably had my own mental health things going on um, in that time, but had lots of support around me, had you know, family close by, had resources, other kinds of conditions that probably supported me and my family. And into my office came a young family, um, uh, you know, probably teen parents, a nine month old baby. And the nine month old baby had some bruising. And I was just struck by the fact that this family had touched many other systems before that we could have prevented this harm from occurring in this family had we had a child and family well-being system, had we not been a system that only once this young family found themselves in crisis, could we provide services or were they identified? And this was a family, you know, who only spoke Spanish, had no um, family close by, um, mom was working two or three jobs, dad was unemployed. I mean, so many um, challenges that really made me understand that families cannot solve these challenges on their own right? This is all of us together across sector, across community, um, across agency that have to work together to have families be strengthened and recognize that children are safer with their families than from their families when their families are supported. So it was really, for me, an eye-opening and very humbling um, experience on, you know, the fact that we had a same age child, but our experiences were so different and the conditions within which we had to navigate those experiences and either overcome and thrive or continue to struggle um, and, and, and really wanted to be part of a, a child and family system. And so I'm just so thankful for even this conversation today. Wow, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in here and uh, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm struck, you know, I was going to start as a therapist as well in my career. So that's, that's where I was headed early on. Actually, if I were honest, um, I was a forestry major uh, when I started college years and years and years ago. Um, so here I am after all these years. But I thought I would be a therapist and I'm so glad that I'm not. Um, you know, therapists do incredibly important work and I find it um, really a, an honorable um, career. But it wasn't the right, it wasn't my purpose. It wasn't what I was meant to do. And the reason I love this question, Jaquay, about you know, what is sort of our origin story um, is because our origin stories, if we think about our origin stories for why we do what we do, I think it can help us find what our purpose is. I think our purpose and our origin are very much connected. And I think we have to know our purpose in this work. We have to know why we're doing this because we're all here on this webinar, I think for one reason, we wanna embark on a, an effort that can take us in a very different place. Um, Sharonda used the best word I think we can use, which is the conditions that families face. How are we gonna start addressing the underlying causes that lead to child welfare involvement? What are the conditions, not the families or the parents themselves, but the conditions that they face? And it's gonna be difficult. I think it's gonna be really difficult. I think it's gonna take time. I think it's gonna take years, if not decades for us to see the, the kind of real progress that we want. And so to endure that, I think we wanna stay grounded in our purpose. So I love putting that uh, question to everybody in the chat too, and it, and it blew up. I mean, you couldn't even read it because everybody was chiming in, which is great. But I think we all can go back to our origin story and find find our, our purpose. And for me, you know, I, I think it's it was pretty clear, it was in 2007. And I took a new job as an independent living case manager. Um, I was working with, you know, it, the, the, for me, it was, it was Cody and it was Rafe and it was Mandy and Micah and uh, Ray Lynn and Kristen. It was, you know, specific kids who I worked with and I built relationship with and I really got to know their experience and I got to know their story. And um, these were kids that uh, I was supposed to help them age out of foster care and become independent adults. And I had a, a bunch of realizations in that work that all happened really fast. One, independence shouldn't be the goal. Uh, we don't want 18 year olds to be independent. We want them to be in community and relationship and family. 
um, but my job was to get them to be independent. And I didn't think that was that was gonna gonna work. Um, you know, the other realization, which was the big one for me, that I think is is what cemented for me that this is my purpose, which was I had this realization, or this belief for me anyway, that, that when we remove kids from their parents and place them in foster care, I believe we make a promise to their family. We make a promise to their family that we can do better for your children than you can at this moment. And on the day that they age out, when Cody, Micah, Rafe, you know, Mandy, when they were going to turn 18 on that day, I felt like we failed in that promise. And um, that honestly, that realization that I had 13 years ago has been what's been driving me. Um, and it's, it's cemented for me that my purpose is, you know, for the last 13 years, it's been how do we make the foster care experience the best it can be? How do we make it better? How do we improve it? What is foster care reform going to be? all of those kinds of things. And I've worked with some really amazing people and we've done some incredible work. I think we've really made an impact. I think we've, we've done some really, really good work over those years, you know, here in North Carolina and, and others and many other places. Um, yet in North Carolina, we've seen a 50% increase of the number of kids in foster care over the last five years. So despite our great efforts and our, our, our desire to make foster care the best it can be, we're getting more foster care. And you know what I've realized this this past year really that, um, and this has become my purpose, you know, tied to my origin story, is the the goal isn't to make foster care the best it can be. The goal is to prevent it in the first place. And it doesn't mean that it's going to go away forever. It doesn't mean that we aren't going to need child protection and, and temporary foster care. I think we probably will. Um, but I think that we need to focus our efforts on family. Um, we need to live up to this promise that I think we've made. Um, to families. And I think we can. I think there's a lot that we can do um, to help strengthen families, to see the conditions that they face, to understand what's happening in community, um, and to redirect our efforts. And, and that's, you know, I, I'm excited about that work. I know it's going to be difficult, um, but, you know, there are a lot of people that are, I think, ready to move in that direction and excited to do this work. And um, I'm excited about it. I think that it's, it's, a, it's a, in part what the Institute for Family wants to contribute to is this movement towards how do we, how do we see families in a way that can help us strengthen families um, and, and to Shronda's point, address conditions. So um, I'm, I'm so thrilled for this conversation today and this group coming together and, and the work ahead of us. So stop there. So I suppose I'm last and um... I would say as, as to the why, you know, to me, it's, it couldn't be more simple. And it's that, that families matter. Um, all families, not just those that look like mine, um, no matter how they're configured, no matter where they're from, family matters. It's where we get our sense of belonging. Um, it is a vital connection for our well-being, And it's time we started acting like that. Um, because if we don't, we'll, we'll simply be on the wrong side of history and the wrong side of justice. And my origin story, um, I'm, I'm coming to understand, um, is really one in having my eyes opened to privilege. Privilege I did not earn and privilege I'll never know what it's like to exist in the world without. And I was most di directly confronted by that as a young 20-something-year-old uh, student teacher who um, was working on the edge of the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation. And I got a sense then in ways that um, I never would have imagined uh, how unfair conditions can be. Um, and you know, seeing families that were um, struggling with normal familial challenges, things that I had family members that struggled with and neighbors that struggled with. Um, but seeing those families that absolutely loved each other treated completely differently. Um, and this, this replicated itself uh, and has and continues at every step of my career. Um, when I worked with homeless and runaway youth um, in Newark, New Jersey, I saw the same thing play out again. Um, and it's a destructive pattern that we've got to own and take on. You know, um, 
simply by being born black, brown, or Native American in this country, your family shouldn't have less of a chance to be together. You shouldn't be valued less. Um, and if you're poor, you shouldn't have less of a chance to stay together either. And I, I think we just have this critical moment to come together during a time of great division in the country around the one thing, I hope there's more than one, but one thing I know that we all have in common and that's that we have families and we should all coalesce around doing everything that we can to celebrate, support, strengthen and acknowledge just how important family is to all of us. Wow, that's really powerful stuff, guys. I am hearing um, this common theme of uh, conditions and wanting to really understand those conditions and um, the things that our families we serve face. And so I'm also hearing a lot about um, what you guys learned earlier on in your careers, um, this theme of 20 something that you guys keep throwing around. <laughs> and so I guess my hope um, for today is really that everyone who's in their 20 something moment um, realizes this earlier on so that they can do work with a very great impact. Um, and so I, I just wanna have a little discussion around, you know, what is really required of leaders or frontline staff um, to, to, to make this happen? Well, I'm just gonna go off of your comment there of the 20 something. Um, referencing and looking at foster youth and then this magical age. And then we say, poof, you are into adulthood. You no longer need support. Go on your way. I want to just kind of move that to um, a parent, right? Who's 20 something, who's young, who's feeling, figuring some things out that doesn't need or doesn't have those supports that have been put in place. I don't care where you're at in life. You always need support. I don't care if you're 80 years old, you still need support. So the way that we are framing this and we are seeing uh, the value of each person and attributing this, this time clock that changes things is I think what puts us a bit in the predicament that we don't see that each one of us is just on our life and we're having these experiences when I go back to my own story, what I can tell you is, is that when I came here, I was, uh, when I got sober, I was like 38, right? And I was about a 15 year old mentally. And, and what I think about are all the people that came into my life, right? And how they nurtured me and they saw me, they didn't see the 38 year old woman. What they really saw was this girl, this child, and they nurtured me. They didn't say you're 38, Sharonda, you should have figured it out by now. Right? They came at me with so much love and compassion and commitment to my development. Right? And they recognized that I had missed some things along the way. And so when I think about our leaders you know, that are put in places to do things differently, the main thing is, is that we shouldn't be looking at the number. We should be looking at the experiences. And what are the experiences that have contributed to the trauma to the lack of development, the numbing, the checking out, the stressors, all of these things that say, I can't deal with how my life has kind of come and, and manifested. Nobody wants the type of things that are happening. No one wants to be poor. Nobody wants to be in child welfare. Nobody wants to be removed from their family. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, that's what we'd like to be able. Those aren't what dreams, those aren't the dreams, right? We all have a, a, the same dream for the most part. My question is, is how does my dream end up looking different than yours? And why did you then attach it that, that I no longer deserve the same things that you also desired? And when we look at our leaders, we need to be very clear about the direction and how we see families. See my family like you would see yours. Invest in my family like you would invest in yours, right? Have the same dreams and hopes for your child that you would have for, for my, your, yours, right? And if we started to really approach it from that place, what we would see is we wouldn't just see a, a, a stabilized child, right? You see a stabilized mama, you see a stabilized sis, uh, sibling group, you see a stabilized community, you see a stabilized society. We're not separate. We're in this together. And so our leaders need to drive us in that place and remind us and lead us to a, a destination of wholeness 
and a worthiness and that there's no less than, right? The journey here really is, is that we're in this together and we should be moving and grabbing all of our folks and taking them alongside of us wherever we find them. I have, I have to jump in here, Sharonda, because you're, you're giving me goof, goosebumps um, as you talk, because I mean, it's just, I think you're, you're saying some really, really important things, um, especially when I think about it from a leader's point of view. So I had a different thought and then I'm hearing you talk and, and I, have a, I have a new thought. So I think probably many people on this call know um, Brian Stevenson and his work and you know, his book, Just Mercy. And um, I think we all as leaders should read that book. Or you know, watch watch the movie. It's a good movie too. Um, his you know what he talks about is this idea of getting proximate, um, or just getting close, or building relationships, really getting to know people's experiences. As leaders um, of large organizations, uh, you know, or sm small organizations, it's really easy for us to get pretty far away from the people that we are here to serve, and that I think is can be dangerous. Actually, I think. If we're not in relationship with people, we really don't truly understand their experiences and we don't see them um, all the time for the strength, the hope, the resilience, the dignity, the potential. And, and then if we don't, we, we serve, we, we provide services in a different way. So, you know, I, I would encourage all of us to find ways to get into communities where we serve families and get closer to the families that we serve and get to know their experiences and ask them. Um, I had a, a, a CEO of a large organization say to me the other day that we're really good at talking about the things that we do as organizations, but do we know what families need us to do? Are we stepping back and asking families, what do you need? And if we ask those questions and start to build relationships, I think we'll start to see our organizations and our work differently. And I just want to, you know, say thank you to, to Sandra and David and, and Melissa. You know, they're leaders of large organizations and they have a vision. Um, for what they want to see happen. And they're willing to communicate that vision. Um, and that's important too, because where our attention goes, our, our energy flows. And they have an ability to shift energy um, into this direction of, of seeing families. And so uh, anyway, Sharonda, great stuff. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. And Sharonda, um, I always feel like I'm at Family Empowerment Church with you when, when you're speaking. And I'm sorry, I got your title wrong. You're actually the public policy director at the Children's Home Society of Washington. So I wanted to correct that and just say thank you for always bringing me to church um, because I think you have a, a lot of wisdom about families, how we should be interacting with families, how we should be supporting families and, and seeing their truth around what's happening and, and, and seeing it like you said, uh, how we would see our own families. So I, I just, I wanted to say how much I appreciate that. And uh, I wanted to um, sort of go back to the, to the article in the pre-read real quick and um, highlight a couple of things that are in there. Uh, if you read the article, Brian Samuels is really explaining in that article why now is the time to take the opportunity to change the way we structure and implement our public systems. You all are hitting on that. You're talking about how our public systems are structured now. He highlights that we should demand wiser use for the over $30 billion spent annually, that's annually $30 billion on a child welfare system, which is mostly focused on investigating reports of child maltreatment and maintaining the out-of-home placements. And in that article, he really pushes us to work with families and communities to reduce the risk that we actually end up creating a new system in the image of the old. And so I wanna, um, I have a question for you all about that. And that really is, um, what do we need to unlearn or do differently to reduce that risk of creating something new in the image of, old, of the old? And Shrounda, I'd, I'd like for you to take us to church again. <laughs> I, I don't have a degree in theology. We won't be doing <laughs> okay. that today. Um, talk to us. Yeah, yeah. The first thing is, you know, we have to stop blaming parents, period, right? I think that when we blame parents, that's the, that's the scapegoat. So we don't have to do any work. They're the problem. If they were okay, you know, we wouldn't be in this mess. Um, and, and that's just not true. So the first thing we need to unlearn is 
Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around for a lot of people, a lot of systems, a lot of, you know, the historical piece. There's a lot of blame, right? And I want to just get out of blame and I want to just get to solution. So what's learned can be unlearned, right? And if we, we start off the world as a blank slate. So everything we have that, we, that we've obtained, we've learned, right? Somewhere along the line, someone has given us the information. I'm hoping that we unlearn that parents are, you know, not redeemable. I hope that we unlearn that family separation is the answer to families that find themselves in a state of crisis. Propelling someone into a crisis that's already in crisis just doesn't make much sense, right? Because then I'm just trying to get through the next crisis. When I really need to get to a place where I can kind of mobilize, get my thoughts together and get moving. When you remove children out of your home and you don't know where your child is, you just tell me how you would be able to mobilize yourself, right? You would be crazed. Where is my child? So family separation is not the answer. Families that are experiencing crisis together can heal together. So we need to also recognize that we can keep families together, that we can infuse supports and resources, and we can get very creative about the ideas on how to keep families together. The other thing we need to unlearn is, is that my family's different than yours, right? Once again, I'll reiterate the, the uh, statement that I made. We all have the same desires. We are far more alike than we are different. The problem is, is that we just try to assign those things. So then we try to elevate ourselves and it's really self-serving, right? I'm gonna elevate who I am and diminish who you are so I can feel better about who I am. Get rid of your hierarchical ladder. It doesn't exist, right? It doesn't really truly exist. When you really try to get down to the depth of humanity, that we're just trying to make it through this thing. And the more that we could join in a joint mission and force of really embracing each other, because walking through life is really hard. And it's hard to walk through it alone. It's hard to walk through it childless. It's hard to walk through it in poverty. It's hard to walk through it in homelessness. And the separation that we do to each other doesn't just harm me. What it really does is it harms you too. You just haven't connected to that. Right, because that's, when I see someone who's homeless, right, that's not my child, but that's my child, right? Like I'm connected to that person, I'm connected. So um, I want us to, you know, unlearn that we are disconnected because <laughs> we're not, right? I want us to walk together in this. I want us to recognize that when we remove children and you place them in a stranger's home, think about this. You place them in a stranger's home and you say, you won't be all right, right? And you don't even know the home you place them in. Let's also add that piece to the story too, right? Because that's a hard truth too that we, we like to dance around, right? That you're rehoming these children and they're better off because that's just not the truth either. So what I'm hoping that we will continue to do is that we will absolutely look at the information, right? And we'll actually do something with it. It tells you a very, very clear path out. And what we're doing right now is not working. It's not helpful. It's incredibly harmful. It creates pathways to outcomes that are dismal, all wrapped in the premise of, we care about you kid, right? And we want the best for you. Uh -huh. So that's what I got. So, I said, yeah. I did go to church. I, I did so go to church. You are too. in church. We're all there. <laughs> we're all there with you. I mean, I think joining forces and unlearning that, that, that we're disconnected, spot on with so much of what you've said. And Melissa, you're getting questions in the chat. I don't know if you've seen some of those about. Oh, I haven't, but I, I, I just want to add, I want to add a couple of things here of other things we need to unlearn. And I see a lot of this in the chat too. We have to unlearn that we have all the answers that will work um, for every family out there, as opposed to we need to listen to families. We have to listen to people with lived expertise that know there are many, many assets and know there are many, many struggles. We have to move from a nation that still has a dominant narrative 
that 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 poor mother is to blame or that poor family or that black, brown, indigenous community is to blame versus recognizing that we all have a role to play in keeping children and families strong. Another thing that we have to really you know, lift up is that children do better when their families are doing better. So this idea that, you know, we are a child focused field and we can, um, you know, put the child in a different place or setting and that they're going to thrive. We know that that's not true. We know based on science, that's not true, right? So just like we know that early adversity can affect our health and well-being, we know that early positive experiences can balance that, right? So we then need to be about uh, uh, coming together to provide that or help to support families in communities to have those strong experiences. And then finally, I, I hope that this was one of the questions because what really drives me a little bit nuts is that we think in the field of child abuse um, and neglect prevention that birth to five is like the only time that relationships matter and that we need to invest in children and families when we know that prevention is lifelong that it's never too late, that we can always buffer risk, we can always put in protective factors at each level of the social ecology that will help outcomes. So I don't know if that was one of the questions, but I think all of those together is what we mean when we say we need to be about a child, family, community, well-being system. We need to be keeping families and communities strong and, and help them access supports when needed, because we all need it. Come on, guys, parenting is challenging year round, but parenting during a global pandemic, acute racial and civil unrest, it doesn't matter how many resources you have. In this time of physical distancing, we need emotional and social connectedness to keep every family strong and thriving. So I just wanna say before David and, and Matt jump in here, that we just heard the CEO of Prevent Child Abuse America say that prevention goes beyond the age of zero to five. And that is something I wanted to just highlight because so often prevention is seen as something for only younger children. And that's how we end up perpetuating a system that's not designed for older youth. So preach, Melissa, thank you. Um, so it David, sounds like you there, yeah. Yeah, I just I'm I'm so moved by this conversation and, and the things that you guys are saying. And I just think it's so simple, right? You know, if you have a customer or a business, um, you want to know from that customer how well you serve them. And I think just that simple concept of really asking families what do they need is really important. I also heard that theme amongst you all saying that and it just really resonated with me because oftentimes you don't ask what do you need? Um, you just look on the outside and then assume, and um, that's not good service, right? You wouldn't reform your business customer service plan in that way. So why do we do it with families? And so that's just my tidbit. Sorry, guys. It's <laughs> great. No, that's that's spot on, Jaquia. I think that that's what people are, are sitting with is how do we know what families need if we're not talking to them, if we're not listening to them? And you're spot on, spot on with that. David, there are questions in there about what we think about the family first Prevention Services Act. We don't want to deviate too much from the original question, but maybe you can work that in. Sure. I, I'm so um, so honored just to listen to what everyone else is saying here. Um, I'm glad to say uh, a few of my thoughts. Um, uh, they, they don't necessarily represent um, the, the agency that I work for, um, but the the Family First Prevention Services Act is important. And I, I think it's a, it's a nudge uh, to the system that will allow it to um, start moving uh, rather incrementally um, in, in a new direction because it will allow for um, certain types of clinical services mainly to be uh, provided um, when children are at imminent risk of entering foster care. So that's in crisis uh, in, in my book or, or really, really close to crisis. I, I worry um, that there are some unintended consequences here um, that in relying only on clinically based services and evidence-based services um, that this could perpetuate uh, disparity in the system 
um, because most evidence-based services have not been tested um, with populations of, of color. Um, the other thing, you know, when, when, I, when I look at the statute, um, I, it, it, it troubles me some is I, I still see uh, written between some lines, some uh, value judgments about worthy and unworthy families and who can get what under what circumstance and for what period of time. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that that can also um, be a form of rationing services. Um, but the important thing is that it is uh, a new funding stream that can be helpful to parents when they need it and can be helpful to pregnant and parenting te teens when they need it. it. Just doesn't go far enough. Um, and I, I think it's contingent upon all of us um, to insist for more. You know, I, I don't think we should settle for um, for, for, for crumbs uh, for, for poor people. Um, so that's, that's some of my thinking, but I would add that it, it has been really, really helpful and important in helping to shift the national conversation and, and helping more and more people talk about prevention. Um, I sure would like us to talk more about uh, well-being and strengthening families than um, just preventing um, bad things from happening. So I'll, I'll, add, I'll add a couple thoughts here. This is, I mean, so much has been said and um, I love what people are putting in the chat and I think I just want to I just want to mention too. You you all are asking some really important critical questions. You know this conversation is really grounded in why we should be having this conversation. Not just this group, but around the country. We we really need to be uh, mobilizing, kind of catalyzing this this conversation about moving towards child and family well being, centering on family, centering on equity, centering on strengthening families. And so I love that, that you all are having this conversation with us in the chat. This is exactly what, what we want and I think what we need um, to, to, to bring us to a new place in the future. And, you know, um, I, I, I think one of the, you know, I've, I've spent my, most of my career in child welfare. And I think that one of the things we need to unlearn, in addition to what, some, what has been said already about, we are not the experts, um, we have to listen. You know, my, my career is sort of predicated on listening and learning to the learning from the, the folks that I work with. Um, that's how I tend to practice. So, so those things, but I, I also think, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need to think that child welfare is going to do all of the work that is required here, um, you know, as one sort of field, one system, one set of organizations, public and private. You know, our, our job, so even with Family First, Family First is, is helpful, I agree. I think it's a positive, important step in the right direction. Um, I think it's a step. I think it's the next step in the right direction and there are more steps to go. I think we all should be thinking about what is Family First 2.0 gonna look like and how is that going to move us further upstream um, to do family strengthening work that addresses the conditions we've been talking about so I think we all should be thinking about that. And again, this unlearning of it's just the work of child welfare to prevent child maltreatment. I don't think it is. I think, you know, having Melissa on here representing child, uh, uh, Prevent Child Abuse America, you know, was intentional because I think we need to at least, you know, uh, prevention, the prevention field and the child welfare field coming together. Um, but we have to, we have to see where is the space that this work of strengthening families needs to exist? Who are the stakeholders? Who are, what are the systems that need to come together? Should we really be thinking, I was thinking about this a lot today, getting ready for this. Should we really be thinking about, you know, wh why don't we have somebody from the criminal justice system on this webinar? Maybe that was an oversight. You know, we have a long history of policies in this country that have impacted um, specific communities and, and specific families, largely families and communities of color that have um, really been disruptive to communities. And I think child welfare is a downstream um, result of some of those policies. And so maybe we should be thinking about how does criminal justice reform help to strengthen families and strengthen communities? Um, you know, so I think that's, for me, I think that's a, that's a big one. There's lots of, lots of things that we can unlearn and, and do different that would help us to Brian Samuel's point in the article, kind of not 
not replicate the same old as we create the new. Um, I think there's a lot that we can do, but I think really considering who, who are the stakeholders and the partners, what's the coalition that needs to come together um, to create this new space where we can do this kind of work, I think is, a, is an important question for, for all of us. So um, it's exciting to, to see, uh, see everybody thinking about that today. Chiquayo, what do you have on your mind? Oh, my wheels are turning over here. I'm hearing I all can this see it. dialogue. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing all this powerful dialogue. And as someone who experienced the system firsthand, I'm super excited to know that we have um, the number of leaders that we do and ground floor workers really um, starting to imagine and see our families as human, right? Um, all families experience crisis and, and um, the child welfare system uh, the foster care system is not just going to go away overnight. You know, there's still going to be a need for um, youth who um, who come into the system. And so how do we uh, reduce that number? How do we really serve these families better? How do we really uh, put aside our own bias to make sure that uh, we can see people for who they are? And um, I'm just really empowered. I feel, I feel great um, listening to this dialogue. And um, I'm really excited to see what you all go home and do differently. You know, um, every um, participant on this call, um, I'd be really eager to know, you know, have you started the conversation within your organization um, that pushes us toward a family well being system and not just child and safety focus? You know, children come from these families. And um, if we are making that promise, as Matt said, um, to do better when we remove them from these families, um, how can we help these families to be strong so that when they reunite, um, because they do need those connections to reunite, that they are in a better position than when we first intervened. And um, I just think that that's really powerful and um, I'm, I'm super excited. How, how about we ask the audience? Were you yeah. all ready? You got your, you got your keyboards ready? Uh, we'd be curious to hear from the audience about what is the number one thing, the number one thing that we need to unlearn or do differently if we're going to get to this family and child well-being system that we're talking about. Flood us in the chat. Um, and, and while you're doing that, uh, you know, Jaquia, something, I, I tend to gravitate to the real concrete things that people say. There's so much that has been said that's been elevated. But imagine a world where Family First 2.0 was designed by families mm. and what that would look like and how different that would be. Uh, that was one of the things, concrete things that I took away is, Imagine the power in that. Yeah, definitely. So we do see that we see the flood coming in. Uh, we, we see the number one thing. Um, it's going really fast. And I, racism, I saw... racism. I saw racism. Mm -hmm. We have not talked about racism like we should have on this on on this in this conversation. David, you started talking about your white privilege, and um, how that has manifested. That is an area, folks. One of the ones I see, culture shift from punitive to restorative. My, that is very powerful to know that we are looking through a lens of not of non-judgment and um, really looking to restore and empower these families. So that's great. Unlearn systemic racism, mm. stigma. And, and, you know, Sandra, I would, I would say to that, you know, it's, I think it's really important for all of us as individuals in this field to do the work that we need to do around race and racism. So, you know, I, I think that's a, that's somewhere that we all can start and really need to and, sh and should start of uh, particularly, you know, um, for, for me as, as a white man in this country, you know, I have to recognize that there are biases that um, I have, um, you know, that are just inherent, you know, uh, living and growing up in our society and you know, I have to, I have to come to understand how those come to operate in my work um, and as a leader in this field and in organizations. And so I think it's, it's, that's an important place to start. And it's why I raised the point of, of why leaders can do the work of getting proximate. I think that part of how we undo racism, part of how we end racism um, is, is by getting to know people that are different from you. You have to, you have to, you have to start by building relationships. And I think that's a it's an important step that we can can take and, and I've seen fathers pop up in the chat a couple of times too and so <laughs> I see Melissa nodding her head I think 
in the prevention space, that probably gets talked about a lot. So well, it doesn't get talked about as much as it should, but yeah, I think relationships are I see a lot here. I see concrete supports quite a lot. Again, you know, helping support families to stay strong being such an important part of this and really recognizing that relationships make the world go round. So nothing about us without us. I think I also saw someone call out. And so again, that intentional um, linking with families and not just about, again, what's broken or what's going wrong, but what's going right. And that strengths-based stuff I see coming out um, a lot here too. Wow. We have a couple of minutes and I'm, I'm tempted to, to throw you all a curveball, So I'm going to do it. <laughs> right, Dequoia, it's gonna yeah. be okay? Yeah, let's do it. We're in good trouble, you and I. <laughs> I see this. I, I think, I think you know, I don't wanna move away from the race conversation too quickly. And I, I think that one of the things that would be helpful for each one of you, Matt, you already touched on this by the proximity and working on undoing racism. As leaders, how, how are you preparing yourselves? What's the work that you're doing personally um, to, be, to be solid in, in creating equitable systems and infrastructures for those that we, uh, we know are overrepresented in the system? And anyone can start. And before we do, I just wanna throw out there that you know, for our listeners, um, one of the big things you know, when we have these conversations is you know, a lot of people go, oh, racism. Oh, what's that? Like, it's not happening. And that's, that's, a, that's an issue. <laughs> you know, if you think it's not happening, then that's part of, of the reason as to why we don't understand um, and respect uh, the conditions in which our families come from that we serve. And so I'm going to pass it along, see, see who's ready to get the ball rolling. I'll just say, I think we have to, as leaders, be, become more comfortable with discomfort and having these difficult conversations. I think sometimes leaders, you're used to having answers and being very solutions focused and going straight to actions. But in a racism training, I was just in recently with Dr. Heather Hackman and my entire network um, that attended as long, uh, along with the Children's Trust Funds, another big network around the country. She says, you know, we can't just have a list. We have to have the lens. Mm. And it's like, as leaders, we're so, you know, you, you go to action, you want to, you know, check things off of a list, but really racial equity and equity of all forms needs to be the lens with which we hire staff, we retain staff, we, we attract staff, we implement services. I mean, it has to be in everything, who we give money to, who we support, what we do with those monies. So it, it really needs to permeate everything. And I think it is going to then be kind of uncomfortable for a lot of us as we learn and continue to learn how to do this work better. Thank you, Melissa. Well, I'll, uh, I'll chime in here really briefly. Um, and I'd say this is, you know, this is something I am uh, thinking about pretty much all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to learn uh, what it means to be uh, anti-racist and um, I would say for those of us in majority culture, uh, especially white guys, um, we got to move beyond intellectually recognizing, you know, privilege and 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 race. Um, we've got to uh, commit to no longer leaving the burden of naming racism uh, to the few black and brown faces in the room, um, and we got to own our part. Um, and how racism is, racism is perpetuated in um, the, the systems that we operate within and how we operate within them. And uh, it's gonna require us to um, make sure that, that everyone's seen and heard. And it's gonna require us to listen a hell of a lot more than we talk, um, not to require people of color to validate their feelings or experiences um, and we're gonna have to start using those words that uh, so many have been too afraid to use because uh, they're the right words and they're, they're the honest ones. And I think that's a, a place of humility from, from where uh, we have to start. Thanks, David. I know we're getting close to time, but I wanna definitely give Shonda the, the floor. 
Uh, I'm just going to end with this. I mean, it'll actually just piggyback off. You know, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that happen. And I think that we really need to get clear about what, 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 what the problem is. This isn't a funding issue. This is an oppression issue. And, and we have to start to really look at the policies that continuously drive the dismantlement of families, um, because that is um, where change can really occur, occur. I want to just end with this super quick. Um, I have this CEO, I'm not going to call him out, but I have the CEO and I'll never forget when I sat in a meeting with him and this guy was so bold in his language, right? He was unapologetic and I just met him. I mean, I see him regularly now, but I was struck by his courage and his willingness to call it out. Um, he didn't do the tap dance, right? This was a white CEO um, that is leading the charge and asking for change for families. And those, because of the demographics of America, right, have to be in this conversation, leading the conversation, seeking allies and partnerships and driving this to where if we really wanna seek justice for families, this is really a social justice issue. And we need to be approaching it from that space um, for change to actually occur for all, all children that are encountering child welfare, because it's from racism to classism that are the drivers that are putting people into the system. Thanks, Sharonda. Appreciate that. All of you for answering that. And Matt, I think uh, we're handing it over to you. Sure. Yes, I'll, I'll be brief here. I know we're a minute over. Um, but let me just say thank you to everybody that came on. Uh, we had a, a lot of people on here, very active in the chat. We're incredibly grateful that you joined us for this conversation. Um, Jaque and Sandra, amazing job as our hosts. So much appreciation to, to you all and Melissa, Sharonda, David. Uh, thanks to you all as well for, for having the conversation, um, being bold in your, in your thoughts and your comments and uh, coming together for this conversation. And I, I do actually wanna say, uh, David, uh, on behalf of you know, myself and, and probably many, many others in the field, just thank you to you and Jerry for the, the years of service that you've given and the vision and the leadership that you've brought to the field. Um, it's, been, uh, it's, it's made a difference, I, I think. Um, I don't think this, this webinar is happening actually without it. So um, I just wanna make that comment. Um, so this, as, as we said at the top, this is uh, episode one of a series of three webinars. So uh, December 3rd is our second webinar. This was intentionally grounded in a more high level why kind of conversation to get us rooted. The next conversation is gonna dive right into a what now kind of conversation. So there are people doing this work. There are practical things happening. There, are, there is movement. The Thriving Families Initiative is happening. The Rewiring Initiative is happening. Those are gonna be the focus areas of the next um, conversation on December 3rd. So we're gonna have folks from Colorado and Nebraska join us. So um, share this. If you found this valuable, share it with your colleagues, ask them to come and join you. Um, you can still register. So we're um, happy to, to have you back on December 3rd. And um, you, you're getting emails from us and probably for many of you, they're going into spam folders as these kinds of things do. Uh, you'll be getting an email in a few days that I think you're going to want to open. Um, so I'll kind of leave you hanging a little bit. We're going to share some follow-up from this conversation that I think you're really, really going to enjoy and find uh, really valuable. So more to come from today and uh, we'll see you all on December 3rd and, and thanks, thanks to everybody. We appreciate you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone. Thanks.